Hi guys, today we are going to talk about a true crime story. As you can probably already tell from the title of this video. Now, I've been watching a lot of true crime videos lately on YouTube and documentaries about it, just like the rest of the world, probably. One of my favorite YouTubers who makes true crime videos is Bailey Sarian. She does these murder mystery and makeup Mondays where she does her makeup and talks about true crime story at the same time. I absolutely love her and you should go check her out after this video, of course. And I got inspired by her, so I'm gonna do the same. <laughs> but of course, I'm going to give it my own little twist, so I'm not just gonna copy her because that will be weird and a little inappropriate. I have noticed that there's not a lot of the, like European true crime stories out there. Like there's like the big ones and some from the UK, but like the other parts of Europe aren't really talked about all that much. And you can only watch so many YouTube videos about Ted Bundy until you feel like you really know the guy, you know? <laughs> so that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna represent Europe in the true crime community. And I'm not talking about England. They're not part of Europe anymore, so... I mean, it's fine. If you don't want to sit with us, then don't. But without further ado, let's get into the video of today. Fuck. I've been feeling so, I've been feeling so down, yeah. Before we get started, a little disclaimer. There will be some graphic descriptions of the crime scene in this video. I'm also going to talk about sexual and mental abuse. So if that's things that like trigger you, maybe don't watch this video. Also, I don't mean any disrespect to the victims or their families. I'm just making this video to report on the story and talk about what happened. And lastly, if I sound sarcastic or like I'm making fun of the situation, I'm not. But I'm just trying to make it a little less heavy than it is. It, I'm not laughing at the situation. It's very serious. And I don't mean any disrespect at all. So I'm gonna put my hair back and we're gonna get into the makeup and into the true crime. Also, if you're wondering what products I'm using, I'm going to link everything in the description below. So, today's true crime story is about Marc Dutroux. And if you're from Belgium, you probably know who this fucking bastard is. <laughs> because it was a pretty big case back in the day, and it still is. Like, everybody just knows who this dude is. The story happy happened? The story happened in the, uh, the late 90s, the mid to late 90s. And I remember my mom always saying that everything kind of changed after this happened. So yeah, I remember my mom saying that after all of this happened, parents got a lot stricter with their kids. They weren't allowed to play outside after dark anymore. They had to stay in front of their house so the parents couldn't see them. So this really had a big impact on all of us, really. And it also exposed a lot of flaws in our justice system. And I don't want to say that the justice system in Belgium sucks, but... It ain't great either. We're gonna talk about that a little bit more later in this video. So a little backstory about Marc Dutroux. He was born in November 1956, which makes him a Scorpio. But on behalf of all Scorpios, we are not all demons. He was the oldest of five. He had four younger brothers and one younger sister. His parents were both teachers, but Marc wasn't really a planned child. Two months after they met, they, got, they became pregnant and because they were teachers, it was very unacceptable to not be married and have a child. They had to get married because it was a little, you know, not done in that in that time. Then for a while they moved to Congo because it was a Belgian colony back in the day. And there were a lot of job opportunities over there to teach. So they moved there, the whole family. But Victor, the father of Mark, he had a lot of issues with authority. He apparently couldn't really get along well with his female co-workers. He was very disrespectful, very rude. So he couldn't keep any job very long. He also accused his wife of cheating while they were there, even though he had a lot of affairs in Congo. He even said that he didn't believe that all the children were his, but, but the kids said that that was totally bullshit and they were. So they moved back to Belgium in 1960 because he just couldn't hold any job very long. And things just got worse from there. Mark describes his father as very distant, very emotionless. He didn't really care about the kids. He only wanted the best for himself and didn't really care about the rest of the family. And that's definitely something that Mark also did with his kids. Also, the neighbors say that they didn't really talk to them. Also, the kids wouldn't play with the other neighborhood kids. They were a very distant family. They didn't really have any social contact outside of their own family. So the truth 
parents got divorced in 1971 and his mother got remarried to another guy and the kids say that they accepted him more as a father than their biological father. Now Mark also didn't really have a good bond with his mother, he talked so badly of her for no really like apparent reason. He apparently blamed his mother for the suicide of one of his younger brothers. He had schizophrenia and uh, he was depressed. And he blamed his mother for having accused his mother of abusing him throughout his life, which his other siblings say that's just not true. They never saw anything suspicious. So, Also, the therapist of his younger brother uh, said that he never mentioned anything like this. So it was highly unlikely that anything like this ever happened. There was also a fight between Mark Dutroux and his mother about the heritage of his grandmother. He thought that he deserved part of the money and his mother got all of the money and they were just fighting about all of those things. So Mark moved out at the age of 16 and all of his siblings say that it was like a big release because he was just terrible. Like his the siblings hated him. He was the same as his dad. He would claim one of the bedrooms all for himself while his other siblings all had to share one. And it's just things like this. Also his teacher said, and I quote, he was a very emotionless child, very distant from the rest. I don't think I ever saw him smile or cry. End quote. Which is just disturbing on a whole nother level. Can you imagine a child never smiling or crying or just... So yeah, besides those things, the apparent reason why he really hated his mother wasn't really clear. They don't really know why. Also, his siblings say that the mother didn't really do anything bad specifically. The police officers did say that, that she didn't come off as a very warm and loving mother, but the rest of the siblings were fine, so I don't know. So when he moved out at the age of 16, he moved in with a gay man. I didn't really find any information about him, also there were no pictures or anything. So I don't really know where they met or where they... why he moved in with him or anything. All I know is that witnesses, like people he knew in that time, they say that he would, the gay man, would pay for everything and Marc Dutroux would repay him with sexual favor. He did graduate high school and he had a diploma as an electrician, but he didn't really had any job because he was just like his father, very rude, not a nice person. During my research, I also found out that he loved ice skating, which I thought was very random. Like, didn't really seem like the ice skating type of guy. So yeah, he spent a lot of time at the ice skating rink, where he also met his first wife. Her name was Françoise butchered the name probably. Anyway, so they met each other at the ice skating ring because apparently Mark was very popular over there. He had a lot of mistresses because he was very charming. A little bit like Ted Bundy, you know, he wasn't really that ugly. It wasn't my type, but... So they met in 1974 and two years later they got married and they had two kids together. He was just awful to his kids, very much like his own father was to him. He just wouldn't give them anything. His wife even said that he called his kids insects and that the only thing they wanted was attention. So that's just <sighs> horrible. So it's no wonder that she divorced him and his kids changed their last names. Now I don't know if they changed their last names after everything happened, or just because they hated their father, but thank God they did, you know? You don't want to walk around with the last name the two at this point. So then in 1988, he got remarried to his second wife, Michelle Martin. This woman is just a whole other story, my guy. Jesus Christ. So Michelle Martin was also somebody he met at the ice skating rink. And she knew about all the other women while he was married. So they got to know each other when he was still married to his first wife. She accepted that he needed more than one woman in his life. Which if that's your thing, that's completely fine. But I just, I don't get it. So yeah, they get married in 1988 and they have three kids together. Which I'm not going to talk about them a lot in this video because they also changed their names. Which is very understandable that they don't want anything to do with this or him or her in any way, shape or form. So then a year later, so, so we're now in 1989, they both get convicted for the rape of five underage girls. So Mark gets... 13 years in prison, just 13 years in prison, and she only gets five. Now the thing about this is, 15 years is nothing. It's nothing. And he got released early, after just three years, because he showed good behavior, and she also got out early. So all of this could have been prevented if he just stayed in jail. But I guess that's not a thing in Belgium. This happens so often. Okay, so my battery died, and it's not fully charged yet, so it may 
today, die again. Let's get into the main story. So on the 24th of June in 1995, two eight-year-old girls went missing. Julie Lejeune and Melissa Rousseau. They were two they were two girls and they lived in the French part of Belgium, Wallonia. They like to go to this bridge above a highway to wave at the people driving by and they were on their way back home from doing that when they went missing. So their parents went to the police right away to tell them that their children were missing. But the police didn't really take them all, all that seriously because they viewed missing children the same as like somebody's bag got stolen. They didn't really care all that much which is just mind-blowing like. So they said just call us back in like 48 hours and we will see maybe they've run away and they will come back eventually. But as you may know statistics point out that the first 24 hours of a child who has gone missing are the most critical because they're they will mostly like get murdered the first 24 hours anyway so 24 hours later they call them back and they say they're still not here and then so then the police started the search party they didn't find anything they didn't have really any leads so it kind of just stopped unfortunately then the police got a phone call from the truth's mother and she was saying that she knows that her son has two little girls in his basement now the police didn't take this serious at all which is just baffling to me how can you when somebody's mother calls say he has two little girls in his basement you're just not gonna you're just not gonna talk about it then in the winter of 1995 Dutroux was in prison for car theft, which gave the police a perfect opportunity to go and search his house. So they went in, it was a police officer, a locksmith, and then somebody else, I don't really know who. And the locksmith, he said to the police officer that he heard the voices of kids, but the police officer just brushed it off and said, oh, they're coming from outside, it's nothing. Which is, <laughs> I mean... Anyway, so they were searching his house and they found videotapes, and they took those videotapes with them to the police station. Now you're thinking, oh, so they watched those tapes. Well, that's where you're wrong, my friend. They didn't. And the excuse later on was they didn't watch the tapes because they didn't have a video recorder. Okay, so my camera died again, so I'm gonna record the rest of this video on my phone. I hope the quality isn't too bad, but we're just gonna have to roll with it. So they find the videotapes and they decide not to watch it because they don't have a video recorder at the police station. You wanna know what's on the videotapes? Well, Marc Dutroux filmed himself building the cage that those girls were in. That's what's on the tape. So if the police officer would have just done their fucking job and watched the videotapes, they wouldn't they would have known that there's a secret dungeon in his basement where the children were trapped in. Because what he had done was he had built a cage inside of his wall. He would cover the door with like shelves so you couldn't see where the door was unless you knew that there was something behind it. He uh, he filmed himself building it so they would have known where the kids were if they would have just watched the fucking tapes but they didn't so because of all these accusations from his his mother and also other witnesses saying that there was something wrong inside of his house they started following him and they placed a camera outside of his house on the other side of the street and they would record him going outside seeing what the fuck he was doing then in the night of the 22nd of august in 1995 two other girls go missing their names are Anne Marshall and Evie Lamonet now they're both from the Flemish part of Belgium, Flanders. Anne was 18 years old and Evie was only 17 years old when they went missing. They were on holidays with friends on the Belgian coast in the city of Austin. And that's where they went missing. They went to a magic show together and they never returned back to their friends. Now you're thinking, they caught them on video camera because they were filming. Now that's where you're wrong again, my friend, because the video recorder that was on the other side of the street filming the house of Marc Dutroux only filmed from 5 a.m. until 6 p.m. You really think he's going to kidnap somebody in plain sight during the day? Well, he actually is going to, but that's not the point. Anyway, so they didn't see anything because it was only filming during the day. So the police didn't have any leads again. And they also didn't connect the two cases because the place where the two little girls went missing, uh, Julie and Melissa, was on the other side of Belgium. Now keep in mind that Belgium isn't a very big country. I live next to the border with the Netherlands and it only takes us like four hours to drive to the other side. So it doesn't really say anything that they happened so far apart. So they didn't have any leads and the father of Anne Marshall was particularly very angry with how the police handled the whole situation because they just didn't care. Then on the 28th of May 1996, Sabine Dardenne disappears when she was on her way to school. 
So she was only 12 years old when she went missing. So Marc Dutroux, he, he pulled her off of her bike and pulled her inside of a white van. So he took her back to his house, where he changed her up to the bed on the first floor so he didn't really take it take her to the basement right away and he told her that he was ordered to kidnap her and ask her parents for ransom but that they didn't want to pay for her um, and that the man who ordered him to do all that now said that he wanted her dead but because he was such a nice man he wasn't going to kill her so in Sabine's eyes her parents don't want her anymore there's somebody outside who's going to kill her which makes for the perfect victim because she's afraid to go outside and she knows that her parents know where she is but they just don't want her anymore which is just the horrifying like he's such a manipulator so because he saved her she had to repay him in sexual favors it's just so sad all of this is so sad because it all could have been prevented Anyway, after a few days he brings her to the basement and she still had her backpack uh, from when she was kidnapped with her. So she started making her math homework to keep herself busy and she would keep her planner and she would put crosses of how many days passed by and she would she would put one cross um, when she got abused and she put two crosses when she got abused and it hurt really bad which is just the, sad, the saddest thing ever I can't even imagine then after being captured for 77 days another girl uh, joined her in the basement her name was Letizia Dele and she was 14 years old so Letizia was kidnapped when she was walking home from the neighborhood pool she was also pulled in a white van and brought to his house but the thing is this time they were witnesses there were a lot of people who saw a suspicious white fan in the neighborhood and they wrote down his license plate so they went to the police and they told them like, we saw this van we've never seen this van before and it was a very like local neighborhood so they traced this van back to Dutroux's house so they went to Dutroux's house and they arrested him so they took him to the police station and started questioning him but also his wife and also uh, a guy named Michel Ledevre. He was the guy who was driving the white van. And he was the first guy who caved in during the questioning. So he was the guy who admitted to kidnapping Letizia. Now at this moment, they don't know that any of this is related to all the other cases. So they confront Dutroux with the fact that his companion said that they have Letizia. And he said, and I quote, we also have the other one, end quote. And he pointed to a missing person poster behind the police officer that was interviewing him of Sabine Dardenne. So they rush to his house. They find the basement, the dungeon, the cage, and they find the two girls. They're both alive. Um, a little malnourished, but they're both alive, and they bring them back to their parents. And that's when he started confessing to everything he did. So he told the police officer about what happened to Melissa and Julie, the first two girls who went missing. So he, he had put them in the same cage as Sabine and Letizia. But because he was in jail for car theft, when they went to search his house and they heard the voices, it was them. Um, because he was in jail, his wife, Michelle, Michelle Martin, was supposed to feed them. But she told police officers that she was too scared to go down in the basement to feed them because she was afraid that they would overpower her and escape. Two little eight-year-old girls would overpower a grown woman. So unfortunately, they starved to death and they buried them in the garden of Michelle's house and they found the remains a little while after. Then the two bodies of Anne and Evie were found next to a house he owned somewhere else. And the cause of their death isn't really, wasn't really clear. Um, they probably think that they were buried alive, but they're not like 100% sure why or how they died. I'm going to do my eyeliner off camera really quickly, so I'll be right back. So when the police were questioning him, he said that he didn't work alone. He said that he worked for a underground pedophile group. And that he kidnapped kids for them. He also said that there were like CEOs of very important companies of Belgium inside of this group and politicians and all that kind of stuff. So there was a investigative judge who was researching this and he had a witness, he found a witness. A girl who said that she was also sold in this in in this group. She could also give details about other murders that had happened and that had never been solved. Um, and she said that they were also murdered by this group. But people didn't really take her seriously. They said that she was um, mentally unstable and that she was just doing all of this for attention. So they didn't really believe her. Then this judge, he... Um, now this judge, he was ordered to stop with his investigation at some point because the government found out that he went to a fundraising um, organized 
that was organized by the father of one of the victims of Dutroux, which meant that he wasn't neutral anymore, so he couldn't be the judge for this case. Now, he also said that that was just bullshit and that judges did this all the time. They had conversations with the victims outside of court and it was just a lot of crap that this was the reason that he had to stop his investigation. Anyway, his investigation got sent to other police officers and they reviewed the case and they said that, that it just wasn't good evidence, that there were no that there was no evidence that that, group, that this group actually existed. Now the fact that this judge got fired created such an outrage in Belgium that they organized a demonstration in the streets of Brussels. So three hundred thousand people came on the streets to to show the politicians that they weren't happy about this, that they were all corrupt and everybody was just sick and tired of how many stupid mistakes were made in this case. Case, the fact that they didn't watch the videos, the fact that they didn't do anything when they heard children's voices inside of the basement, all those kind of stuff. People were just fed up. Now because of all this controversy around his case, he didn't get convicted until 2004. So it was him, his wife, Michel Martin, and um, Michel Lelievre, the one who was driving the van, who were sitting in court. So Dutroux got life in prison for the murder of Anne, Evie, Julie and Melissa. Also for the kidnapping of Sabine and Letizia. Then Michel Lelievre, he got only 25 years. And Michel Martin, his wife, she got 30 years in prison. Um, and she applied for an early release like four times and it always got denied. Then the fifth time it got accepted because she could go to a monastery here in Belgium. There were nuns who were going to take her in to make sure that she wouldn't do anything wrong. When I tell you that people were pissed off, that's an understatement. So yeah, people were pissed off. There were a lot of demonstrations again on, again on the streets, but they didn't really help. So she lives with some nuns somewhere in Belgium now, which is just insane. She let these kids starve to death and she's out free. It's just insane. Now, also, Dutroux was applying to get out earlier, and his requests have been denied since today. He's still in jail, thank God. And the Belgian justice system is fucked up, but if they let him out, I think I think somebody else will shoot him. It's just, like, everybody hates this guy so much. So, yeah, he's still in jail. His wife is chilling with some nuns somewhere. Michel Le Lievre is also still in jail, and they never got any proof of this underground group of pedophiles so we don't know if it really happened if it was just all a hoax to get some more time i don't know it's still a mystery till this day and maybe one that i don't even want an answer to because that's some scary ass shit my dude so yeah that's it for this case it's just that so much of this case could have been prevented if people would have just done their job. They would have just watched the videos if they would have just investigated more when you hear children's voices coming out of a basement. If you just made sure that the cameras in front of his house were rolling like 24 hours a day. It's just all very sad and I hope nothing like this ever happens again. I hope Belgium fixed their justice system because it's really fucked up. It still is. Anyway, <laughs> thank you so much for watching. If you watched until now, good job. Wow. <laughs> if you like this video, if you like my look, if you like me, please don't forget to subscribe to see all my other videos. Please turn on the notification so you don't miss any other upload of me. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and I will see you in the next one.